Um, tonight we're going to, this afternoon we're going to talk about a little bit the, the creation of the world and in particular uh, sort of the reconciliation between the Torah's view of the age of the world as opposed to uh, what the predominant secular or scientific community uh, says. Now, a cursory look at the, at the traditional teachings of Judaism would suggest that the world is only about 6,000 years old. Um, and truth be told, the, if a person would believe in theory that the world was older, it's not one of the, truly one of the pillars of our faith. It's not like, obviously, you know, if a person doesn't believe in God or believes that God has a nose, so you're believing something outside the pale of Judaism. If a person doesn't believe in Mashiach, or doesn't believe in Tzchiyos HaMesim, or doesn't believe in free will, also outside the pale of Judaism. It may not be as fundamental when discussing the, the age of the world. So um, if, a, if a person, I, I, I don't think that anyone in this room would have an issue, but if, if anyone would have an issue or had an uncomfortable feeling or whatnot, um, the, that is, it's sort of a, a, a side topic that is rather interesting to discuss, but I don't know one that it has to be one of our main missions in, in convincing people of. Nevertheless, um, I want to go through some of the classic ways in which not only the Torah community, but the society at large has dealt with this question about the, the age of the earth and the age of the universe. Um, and then get to the more traditional approach, the Rebbe's approach, um, and the, the collective traditional approach that we've seen throughout, throughout our history. So one of, the, one of the, the very first ways in which the sort of secular society, those people who are inclined towards secularism but have sort of a respect for the Torah or respect for the Bible, one of the very first ways or things that they will do in order to sort of uh, reconcile the difference, you know, the difference being uh, Adam is, we, we believe, 5,776 years ago, and the earth being created uh, six days prior to that. Whereas the scientific community would say that the earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old, and the universe somewhere between 13 and 15 billion years old. So those who are, live a predominantly secular life but at the same time have sort of a respect for Torah, a lot, of the, a lot of them will assume that when the Torah says day, that the first day, second day, uh, and it uses the word yom, that it's not a literal day, and they'll say it means more like an era or an epoch, you know, back in the day or in the days of the dinosaur, uh, not talking about a literal 24-hour day. That, that's the first perspective. You don't find it so much in the, in the Torah community. You'll find other, other ways to sort of reconcile it. But this approach is, is predominantly a, a secular approach that people who are, are, live predominantly secular lives, but at the same time um, sort of have a, a respect towards the Bible, towards the Torah, and wish to reconcile the two. So a day is not a day. That's the, the first sort of uh, idea that will be put forth. There's, there's some issues with that. One of the issues with that is that one of the commandments that we have is to keep Shabbos. And the predominant reason to keep Shabbos is because Hashem created the world in six days and stopped creating on the seventh day, rested on the, on the seventh day. And there's really no reason to assume or to sort of uh, to, to, to think that when Hashem says keep the Shabbos day, uh, that day is talking about a 24-hour day that we're meant to keep uh, forever eternally, and that the previous six days are somehow t talking about each billions of years or different eras uh, or whatnot. That's one, that's one um, sort of shortcoming. Um, another shortcoming, and, and one thing that, that people may, may, uh, may, throw at, may throw out, so those who maybe know a little bit more about the Torah text, about the Bible text, they'll say that, you know, the Torah says day, but at the same time, it doesn't say that, uh, it says that the, the sun and the moon, for example, were created on the fourth day. So what about day one, two, and three? You know, that those days maybe could have been longer uh, because the sun and the moon weren't created until the, uh, the third or fourth day. And one, one thought uh, about that idea 
is that a day is really not determined by us seeing the, the sun or the moon in the sky. You know, you have places like Antarctica or the North Pole where you could not see the sun for six months or see the sun only for six months. It doesn't mean that it's one long day uh, or one long night. It just means that you haven't seen the, the other uh, sun or moon in the sky. It's a 24-hour it's a period, the amount of time that it takes the, the, um, the Earth to make one full, one full spin. Um, that 24-hour period is what marks a day, not necessarily seeing a sun or moon uh, in the sky. So, is that true regarding Shabbos? Mm -hmm. in, in those places, is that true regarding Shabbos? Regarding Shabbos, in, in those places where you, you don't see it, so, yeah, you, many times you would ascribe to the, uh, the time of, of the closest city that does experience a, a change. Um, so that, that's one sort of uh, ideology, not necessarily uh, that, that one that you'll find in the Torah community, but one that you'll find nonetheless. The, the, probably the, the, from, a, from a Torah perspective, the main issue with that is that the Talmud, the Gemara and Chagiga, says very specifically that one of the things that were predetermined, <coughs> one of the things were set up, before the creation of the world is that a day would be a 24-hour period. Um, and so it, it's kind of difficult to, to call those other time periods eras or, or epochs when it, it, the Talmud says that a day means a day, a 24-hour 24 24-hour period. Now, in the Torah community, there are other ways, uh, you know, culling from our, from our collective Torah thought all, all of our Torah literature, there are other ways that the, the idea has been discussed. And one of the ways is using sort of uh, vague statements from Midrashim or, or vague statements perhaps even from the Zohar that, that teach or make reference to uh, the idea that Hashem could have created worlds prior to this one. There's a Medrash, for example, that says that Hashem you know, created, before He created this world, that there were previous worlds that, that were created. Um, and one, one way to interpret that would be that there were earlier, that there were earlier periods, there were earlier sort of cycles uh, and, and time periods. And then when Hashem was done with those sort of physical existences, He just, you know, started fresh and, uh, and made a, a new civilization or a new, uh, a, a new reckoning and we were starting fresh from, from this new cycle. Um, the truth is, many of the early Kabbalists even subscribed to this idea that these, when it said that Hashem was creating and destroying worlds, that it was talking about physical worlds. And so much so that in the late 1800s, when they began unearthing mammoth, uh, mammoth remains, or frozen mammoths or, or, di or dinosaur bones, some of the sages of the time were actually, they wrote endorsements of the idea the most famous is the Tiferes Yisrael, um, who, who wrote uh, when, when the mammoths were, were discovered that, wow, this is, this is great. It's confirming what the early Kabbalists, what the early sages had, had written, that Hashem has uh, created worlds and, and destroyed worlds, um, and talking about it in a physical sense. Um, another sage of the time, Rav Shimshon Farrell Hirsch, uh, also sort of endorsed the idea. Um, gave credence to the idea that, that these were physical worlds and that after their, their time was up, Hashem sort of started uh, the next cycle. They refer to them sometimes as like sabbatical cycles, that the, that the world uh, exists for 7,000 year cycles and then Hashem sort of uh, press, presses restart or refresh and we start a whole new system of operation. There's a few, there's a few issues uh, with, with that ideology. And this is one that's found very much in the Frum world. Um, it is, it is uh, you know, it has legitimacy. It has uh, backing in some of our early texts. There are, there are, some, there are some issues with it. Number one, um, many contemporary sages, including the Rebbe, say that when the Tiferes Yisrael and uh, Rabbi Shem Shalom Hirsch, for example, were describing, were, 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 were were enthusiastic and endorsing of these uh, worlds, uh, about, about the physical world and about mammoth bones and whatnot being discovered. They, they say, uh, the Rebbe writes, and also Rav Chaim Kanievsky writes, that they may have been motivated uh, based on the nature of their time to sort of 
almost as like a sense of kiruv, almost as a sense to to sort of uh, bridge a gap uh, and uh, and be able to discuss with Jews who at the time were very much you know assimilated and unaffiliated uh, as a way to sort of uh, endorse an idea that may not be sort of a, a mainstream idea. So that's that's one sort of challenge or difficulty. Another idea, another another challenge, um, or challenge this to this particular idea is that the latter Kabbalists, the latter day Kabbalists, uh, ultimately, you know, concluding with the Arizal, or beginning with the Arizal, um, say that these worlds, when, when the Madrash says that Hashem was creating and destroying worlds, it's it was discussing spiritual worlds and that they are that they are really not they're really not physical worlds. And since the Arizal is seen by uh, the collective Jewish family as the final authority on Kabbalah, it would seem that, that those worlds are to be looked at as purely spiritual worlds and not, and not as physical worlds. One thing that's, that's really interesting, though, um, is that there may even be a way to sort of reconcile this idea, like why would the early Kabbalists write that it was a uh, physical world, and the later Kabbalists, in particular the Arizal, write that it's a purely spiritual world. Like, wh why the distinction, why the, uh, why, why the, the uh, seeming disunity? And, and it's a very interesting answer or idea is at, is at least offered by Dr. Alexander Polterak. Um, he's a former professor of bio, biomathematics at Cornell Medical College. Um, and he suggests a really interesting idea. He says, um, part, of the, part of a developing approach in physics today is that there's a lot of emphasis that's placed on the human observer. That the human observer is, is, a, is an entity, is a being that sort of, in a way, almost makes reality. In other words, that certain things of reality don't really exist until there's a human observer to observe them. And this is kind of connected with, uh, with a very old philosophical question. I want you to finish, finish the, uh, the end of the sentence. If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around to hear it, what, does it make a sound? Right? And so what would we think, well, what's our gut feeling? Of, of course it makes a sound. It, uh, uh, duh, you know, it's a tree, it's a big tree, it falls in the woods. Of course it's making a sound. Just because nobody hears it doesn't, doesn't uh, change anything. But the reason that this has stayed a, a, a very prominent philosophical discussion is because the only thing that we know about sound, or the only experience that we have of sound, is when there is an ear or some sort of vessel to capture the waves, the sound waves, that are coming out from that tree hitting the ground. In other words, if a deaf person is in the woods and the same tree falls, it's not going to make a sound to him. And because there's no, there's no working Kaylee, there's no working vessel to process the, the sound waves reverberating and, and so for it to be processed and registered, uh, as a sound. And you say, well, you just put a tape recorder in, in, in the woods, it's the same thing. There's a vessel there that is processing these sound waves. But if there is no vessel there to, to process it, does it indeed, does it make a sound? And so, uh, on, on a similar way of thinking, um, physicists have actually uh, seen, uh, lately, especially in the 20th century, uh, beginning in the 1930s and, and, and uh, much more recently, that that reality, in some sense, only really truly exists when there's a human observer there to observe it. Now, the concept is a really wacky idea. One of, one of, the, one of the key teachers in this, in this line of thought was a, a, a physicist by the name of John Wheeler. He wasn't, wasn't a Jewish physicist, uh, but he was considered one of, the, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, maybe even second only to, to Einstein. And some of his ideas were, were so, so fascinating and so connected with uh, a Torah thought that the Rebbe, when, when the Rebbe uh, read some of his writings, uh, saw the, the correlation between chassidus, chassidic philosophy, and, and these new ideas in, in quantum physics that were, that were coming out, and he asked the secretariat to send John Wheeler an English copy of the Tanya to, to show this John Wheeler, that these ideas that he's, that he's uh, coming up with are not new per se, but they are sort of interesting uh, 
uh, he's, he's sort of bringing uh, more tangible evidence to ideas that have been uh, long in existence. So Wheeler, John Wheeler says that acts of the observer uh, are, are essential to reality. Uh, in some sense, the, that, uh, what, what the, the idea would be, uh, according to this ideology, is that before Adam was created, before Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve are created, that the world sort of exists in a sort of proto-physical state. And w one, of the things that they've, one of the things that they've seen is that subatomic particles will react differently when there's a human being watching them. You, you, think, that, you think like how or why, that's, that's one of the things that they're, that they're discovering now is that subatomic particles actually do different things when there's a human observer. That the human observer actually does play a real role in the shaping of reality. So one of the, one of the ideas that's offered by Dr. Polterak is that before Adam and Eve are created, you have six days uh, of where no human being is is even around, and therefore reality exists in sort of like a quasi physical or quasi spiritual state. And then all of a sudden, human beings are created. Now there's a human observer, and all of a sudden, this quasi spiritual state uh, snaps into existence and becomes an actual physical entity from from then on. Um, that's that's one of the ways that that he offers a a sort of uh, bridge between what the early Kabbalists say that the universe, uh, when, when God was creating and destroying worlds, that that's, it was talking about physical terms, and the Arizal, who says that these ta are talking about spiritual worlds, one way to sort of reconcile the two in light of recent discoveries. Um, so that, that is another, that's certainly another way that is uh, discussed and uh, even you know, within from circles and traditional uh, circles. Uh, that you may hear or that you may that you may see another uh, another uh, sort of recent uh, a new understanding uh, many of you may have read uh, books by the MIT physicist professor Gerald Schroeder um, who has books like um, Genesis and the Big Bang or the science of God where he offers an idea that depending on where you are in the universe time is experienced differently so in one area uh, perhaps we, where the universe began, it could have been six literal 24-hour days, whereas on Earth that was experienced as several billion years. Um, that is sort of a new idea. It, I, don't, I don't know uh, necessarily where exactly uh, in, our, in our collective Torah literature uh, that idea would be found, but, but he, he offers an interesting and, uh, you know, something just to consider, some, some food for thought uh, in, in, that, uh, in that regard. Uh, I want to I focus in on a little bit uh, the more, more so in the, in the traditional approach, though. So all, all of these are, are nice approaches, and they're all approaches that are used either in the, in the from world or uh, even in the semi-secular world. But I want to discuss a little bit uh, this, this afternoon about... Uh, sort of the traditional look and and how perhaps you know we can we can bridge this idea that uh, the world is in fact uh, approximately six thousand years old um, as opposed to uh, maybe four point five billion years old again i don 't want to discount any of the other uh, ideas that are offered the you know they certainly have uh, you know legitimacy to them and they certainly are are interesting ideas to, to think about, but I want to zero in especially on the, the, the more traditional look or at least the, the way that we typically, uh, typically view these types of things. Um, before we discuss it, I also want to make a disclaimer that Judaism is not in any way, shape, or form uh, against science. That's, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's proper that you know, we, we uh, we look at science as a as a bad thing. Certainly, the Rebbe did not look at science as a bad thing, and encouraged, you know, on more or less every front, to to pursue scientific discovery. Uh, but we have we have to also, um, you know, make a make a distinction between 
you know, science and, and scientists and different things that shape uh, scientific perspective. And I want to go through some of those, some of, some of those uh, things as well. Many people think of scientific conclusions uh, as infallible and scientists as sort of impartial robotic beings uh, who serve merely as conduits to relay pure observation and systematic logic. This is far from the case. You know, scientific thought has trends that shape its conclusions, uh, as well as societal norms um, in, at any given time that it conforms to. Scientists are human beings. They're immersed in culture. They have their own preconceived uh, agendas and, and uh, emotions and, and perspectives uh, as well. That's, those are not my words. That's, that's from the, the famous evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould, who says that the idea, the stereotype of the fully rational and objective scientific method with individual scientists as logical and interchangeable robots is a self-serving mythology. In other words, that uh, as the theoretical physicist John Polkinghorne says, that scientists, like anybody else, um, assess their data through theoretical spectacles behind their eyes. Meaning evidence is, is on the table for any given thing and based on a person's worldview you will interpret the evidence according to what the preconceived worldview uh, that you have. In fact many times throughout history there were key discoveries that were made by, by a researcher who um, found what they found because they, they didn't find what they were supposed to find, meaning they didn't conform to the, the societal perspective. They didn't find what, what, was, what everyone uh, assumed you were supposed to find. They, they just let the evidence guide, guide them to where, it's, to where it went. Anyone have any idea uh, what the first planet to be discovered was? The first planet that was sort of really like discovered. Okay, Earth, that's a, that is a good guess. <laughs> You're probably right. The first non-Earth planet to be discovered. Mercury. Wasn't Mercury? Jupiter. Pluto. Mars. Sun. April. Saturn. Uranus. Uranus. Okay. Uranus. Yeah. Right. No, it's not Uranus. That's a, uh, it's from, uh, you know, it's good for high school jokes and middle school jokes, right? Right, Uranus is full of gas. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Anyway, so Uranus what is, is the first one to, to be discovered. Why is it the first one to be discovered? Because Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn can be seen with the naked eye. They're faint in the night sky, but if you, if you know what you're looking at and, you, and, you're, and you're careful and you, and you, you see that they, they're not twinkling, they're, they are planets. Um, and those are things that have been seen since, since the very beginning of, of human history. The, very, the first one to be discovered was in the, was in the more modern era when, with the, with the assistance of telescopes, was, was Uranus. This was by uh, William Herschel in 1781. And one of the reasons why he found it was because he was, in some ways, an amateur. You know, but after he found that planet, they had sort of backtracked and looked and see, like, how come nobody discovered this, this planet before? Well, it was always assumed to be something else, like a star, for example. In fact, there's an article in Scientific American that says that the planet was discovered nearly 20 times before um, William Herschel discovered it. So how come, how come he actually discovered it and the rest of those 20 times it wasn't considered as it was discovered? Because until that time, there could only be six planets. Everybody was saying, there's only six planets. There's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. There can only be six. So if you find something else that appears to be a planet, it's not a planet, because there's only six planets. So he's credited as the one to discover it, and he, he, didn't, he didn't mold to, the, to what the, the rest of the community, scientific community was talking about at the time, because he was... He was kind of an amateur. He wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't engrossed in that, in that ideology, and he was able to call the evidence what it was. That, that's, that's, a, that's a planet, and he was right. 
there are, there are a lot of other things that sort of shape evidence that, again, the idea of a, of a scientist being sort of like a, you know, this pure conduit who's just relaying whatever they see is not, is not necessarily 100% uh, true. There, there are other things that, that go into the interpretation of evidence. There's nationalistic considerations, there's political scenarios, and there's even economic concerns, like funding, for example. Um, there are, there are certain things that, that will shape, uh, shape the way that, that, people, that people view things. If your funding is coming from a, from a certain place, certain organization, you're going to want to find things that are in line with what your organization wants. For example, you know, for decades, studies were conducted by highly, qual highly qualified and reputable scientists um, at major institutions, and they could not find a link between smoking and emphysema, and lung cancer and addiction. And perhaps the, the reason may be because up the chain, these organizations were being funded by big tobacco. And you don't, you don't uh, cut off the hand that feeds you, right? So it would be, they wouldn't lie, it would be like, oh, it's inconclusive, or other various vague uh, descriptions that, that wasn't a lie being told, but if you're going to come out and, and say straight out that, look, there's a clear correlation, and what's feeding you and what's, what's promoting your organization is up the chain is, is this particular organization, you, you, may, you, may, uh, you may lack in funding. The same thing can be said about you know, nutrition and drug, and drug companies. Um, we're, not, we're not calling, I don't want to give, give the impression that you know, we're talking about some sort of like, you know, backroom conspiracy or anything, but but the the idea the idea is it's a very natural idea that there are things that sway us and sway our minds, and you can say things that that uh, can be true, but if you phrase it properly, you know you can you can sort of say anything. You know, NASA is a is a government funded organization, and if they were to come out with something, uh, you know that that showed evidence that of something that the government perhaps didn't want endorsed or didn't like, they, they may lose their funding for that. So they have to sort of couch their words uh, appropriately if, if, the, if the need uh, arose. Just, just as a side point, this is a really interesting uh, thing happens. You know, in the 1960s, so the world powers that were in existence at the time were the United States and the Soviet Union. And those were the superpowers of the time, the Cold War. And so during that period, there was a time where, uh, you know, during the whole, like, you know, space race, who's going to be the first to get into space and who's going to be the first to get on the moon, that was like a big, that was a big deal thing. There was, there was one time there was a competition between uh, the United States and, and the Soviet Union uh, as to see who's, who's tech, who is, you know, becoming more technologically advanced, who is, who is ahead of the game, who is cutting edge. And so at the time, the United States won out. They won out big time. Now, in the Russian papers, they, they, didn't, they didn't say that the United States won, um, but they also didn't want to say that the Soviet Union lost. So how did they couch their words? They said like this. The headline was as follows. Think about it like this. Yesterday, the world superpowers all competed to see who was ahead in the space race. The Soviet Union came in second, and the United States in second to last. <laughs> now, were they lying? No. They weren't lying at all. There's only two, there's only two in the competition. That's true. So the idea is that, that there are ways. There are ways of saying the truth sometimes and sort of appeasing your, your audience or whatnot, but there are, there are, there's much more to the picture sometimes um, that when uh, ideas or conclusions or theories come out that there, there may be some other background things like you know, lenses behind the, behind the eyes that are shaping uh, the interpretation of the evidence at hand. Um, there's a lot of things that sort of get adapted into society that become part of our societal culture uh, that we believe as truths that maybe aren't, uh, maybe aren't so true. Did, did anyone ever learn in school, right, 1492, Columbus 
sailed the ocean, ocean blue. blue. Yeah, we just got, we got to do it. Right? It's like one of those things you got to say. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Another thing that you may have learned in high school is that, or probably even before that, even in elementary school, is that the people of the time thought that the earth was flat, and by Columbus setting sail, he showed that the earth, the earth was not flat. Right? Anybody ever learned that in, in school? Yeah. Right. It's still taught in public schools uh, to this day. Anyone, that, that's, that's completely false, by the way. The educated community has known that the world is round since the, Greek, the time of the Greeks. So we're talking about in the early, in the, in the BCEs, right? So f for over 2,000 years, the, was well, the, the, the educated community thought, knew that the world was round. So how, where did this big idea, and this is actually tied to the discussion that we're having today, where did this big idea that, that Columbus was, was the one who showed that the earth was round, before then the people thought it was flat, um, when, when, did that, uh, when did that gain uh, prominence? So, Dr. James Hannum, who is a member of the British Society for the History of Science, wrote that the misconception that the majority of the medieval world believed in a flat earth gained currency, I mean, gained popularity in the 19th century because of inaccurate histories. Meaning in the late 19th century, late, late, late 1800s, that's when this idea that, oh, they used to believe that the earth was flat, it, became, it, came, it came to the forefront because of false histories. Now, why would, why would someone, why would, why would a false history sort of be created? So, Dr. Jeffrey Burton Russell, who is the professor of history at the University of California, uh, says that the myth that most medieval people believed in a flat earth became widely publicized when? After 1870. And it had to do with ideological struggles over evolution. Late 1800s, 1870, the, the theory of evolution is, is getting popular. People are, you know, it's get, the word's getting out there. People are, are, are gung-ho about this, this new idea, this new discovery. And so in order to sort of create this fictitious history, that science and religion are, are worlds apart, or that they, that they can't merge together, They're, they created this sort of pseudo-history that if, you know, all, those, all those people who, were, who clung to their religion right in the middle, middle Ages, they believed in a flat earth, and it took Columbus coming to America to discover that the world was actually round and that you won't fall off the edge if you get past the horizon. So, and the way that, the way that this uh, professor made this discovery. So he looked in textbooks before 1870, and he saw that this, this really wasn't a thing that was discussed, that flat earth not, that wasn't, wasn't discussed at all. After 1870, find all over the place that those archaic middle-aged religious people believed in a flat earth, creating this idea that religion and science don't, can't go together, that they're, if you believe in science, you believe in this like archaic, outdated philosophy, and you know, only, only embracers of this new enlightened thinking are, have any, you know, intellectual fortitude with them. I could, the, the examples could, could literally go on um, for, for a while. Those of you who, who maybe are interested uh, um, might as well plug, plug, my, plug a book. I uh, just wrote a book recently uh, that one of the chapters, really two of the chapters, discuss the age of the, of the world, uh, the age of the universe, and, and the age of the planet. Those who are interested, there's a special discount after this uh, lecture. We'll put that aside. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about um, the way in which uh, uh, calculations about the Earth's age are, are measured. Now, we, we, we certainly don't have the, the time to, to go into each field of science that would discuss, you know, how um, how exactly uh, each, each uh, in, within each category of science that the, the, the age of the Earth is, or the age of the universe is calculated. In astronomy, it's done one way. Uh, th the age of the universe is calculated through, you know, uh, looking at the distant stars and, and, and whatnot. Um, within, within Earth science, geology is, is one study, and then there's radioactive dating. Uh, so, several of those are discussed um, in the book and in several other great books. Um, there's one trend 
that that you will find throughout throughout the entire uh, th throughout the entire uh, scientific community and in, in really every category of science that that could be is that one of the reasons that we're not saying or again we're not saying that the scientists that their conclusions are wrong per se but what we are saying uh, is that the scientific community can only measure that which is truly measure and in an accurate way that which is pertinent today that which that which exists today and the rules and, and laws and and results that apply today are are what's uh, what what shapes their results backtracking it into you know into a seemingly endless past will will show that um, that in, in, in the past time, there, there could be very different conclusions. For example, if, 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 if the way in which uh, geology, for example, uh, if they're going to calculate how old uh, a particular ge geological um, structure is, so they may measure based on how, how uh, fast the, the rate of, let's say, a mountain is growing now. If there's two plates, two tectonic plates, like pushing against each other, that are you know forming uh, a mountain or whatnot, the the way in which uh, you, you may they, they may calculate is based on x amount of inches or feet that you know that that it's growing now is basically how it's how it's always been. Same thing with you know let's say like the Grand Canyon. You have the Colorado River which runs through the Grand Canyon. Well, they they project that that was all at one time one uh, one level ground and then. Through years and years and years, you know, sort of uh, wearing it away at at, at, a, at a level pace, it it got to be the the Grand Canyon. So if if a person is going to use a uniform incremental method and trace it back, so it would it would result in millions of years that it would take the Colorado River to be, to uh, make this uh, structure called the called the Grand Canyon. Now. This idea of like uniformitarian thought wasn't always the way that it that it that it was. Um, geology as a study became popular in the 1600s and then really gained popularity in the 1800s. Originally, the original geologists, some of the original um, geolo um, geological researchers, also happened to be clergymen, and they also believed in things like a worldwide flood. And so there, there was a belief in sort of uh, catastrophic events, quick catastrophic events that shaped major things in the Earth a um, long time ago, and that you can't necessarily you know, judge from a sort of uni unif uniform uh, rate of change that there were these catastrophic events that you know, maybe made a mountain overnight, or maybe made a valley overnight, or, or really uh, drastically changed the geological uh, structure uh, of the planet in very quick uh, periods of time. The way uh, when it, it, it changed really in the in the, the late 1800s um, by uh, it, it ultimately changed by a, a gentleman by the name of Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell was a, a lawyer and a um, also studied geology, um, and he published a a, uh, a very influential three volume study called the Principles of Geology, and that that work, that those volumes became very popular and his, he didn't believe in a worldwide flood and he thought that the, the best way in which you could judge what happened in the past was by what is known about the present. And so this sort of uniform, uh, uniform theory that everything sort of uh, uh, um, changes in a, in, a, in a uniform way over time was, became like the very accepted uh, popular view. It's interesting to note, uh, briefly, that anyone have any idea who a really good friend of Charles Lyell was? Charles Darwin. Yeah. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, it, it, they, he played a, a very major role in Darwin's conclusions as well. Darwin wrote in a letter in 1844, he says, I always feel as if my books came from half of Charles Lyell's brain. Um, also, Janet Brown, a professor of history of science at Harvard, said that without Charles Lyell, there would be no Charles Darwin. So in other words, that the, this ideology of slow incremental change over, 
long periods of time were, was, a, was an ideology that was uh, developing and became popular in the late 1800s. Before then, catastrophic ideas, catastrophic changes were, were, were believed, were accepted. Um, and certainly from a, from a Torah perspective, uh, we believe those as well. We believe in a worldwide flood. We believe in before the, the flood of Noyach, that there was the flood that happened in the generation of Enosh, which the ocean encompassed one-third of the, of the landmass. Uh, and it was a another very significant change in the world, um, that the continents split, that there was major upheavals in um, early history that, that drastically changed the geological layout, that things, aren't, that things haven't stayed in this sort of incremental change. Now, we're, again, we're not going to go through uh, every, every field of science, but the, the main concept to consider is that everyone is considering that the change, the rate of change in, in radiocarbon dating, it would, uh, or excuse me, radio, radioactive dating, it would be that you know, the rate of decay is exactly the same as it is now. It always was the same. No, no factors have changed that. And therefore, using these small increments, we can backtrack uh, X amount of millions of years or even billions of years to, uh, to get to the uh, original source. When it comes to geology, we know that there were major catastrophic events in the Earth's history. The, there's uh, the crater that they say killed the dinosaurs, the, 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 the meteor. They said it hit Earth and killed the dinosaurs. Um, they say it was it hit, hit in the Gulf of Mexico. They say that it was six miles wide that it weighed billions of tons, and that it blasted the Earth at 45,000 miles an hour. Now, just to give you an idea of how fast 45,000 miles an hour is, is that seven times the speed of a bullet. So you have this massive rock that smacks into the, smacks into the Earth and in the Gulf of Mexico. That's where, the, that's, where the, uh, that, that's, that's where everybody agrees that it was. Um, and... At the, at the same time, through that, there's major upheavals in the planet. There's earthquakes, there's volcanic activity that's unleashed, there's uh, you know, massive amounts of dust that go into the air, there's atmospheric changes, there's a lot of changes that the scientific community says took place when they said it killed all the dinosaurs, that it made them extinct. Well, that's one certain cat catastrophic change that, that happened in the Earth's, excuse me, in the Earth's past um, that we know about. There are others that we, that we know about as well. From a Jewish perspective, you know, there were major upheavals like, for example, the flood, and, the, and like we mentioned, the uh, previous floods uh, before that. So th there's, there's actually an interesting idea discussed by uh, Dr. Hanoka, um, he's a Lubavitcher, uh, he, he writes, he was encouraged by the Rebbe to write down his uh, ideas, his, his conclusions. He, he writes, uh, he brings the idea, perhaps, he just passed away, he just passed away recently. Um, a great thinker, a great scientist, a great scholar, um, and, very, and highly encouraged by the Rebbe to, to uh, you know, pursue the work that he was doing. So one of the things that, one of the things that he suggests, perhaps, you know, there, there is a um, the theory about you know, the, the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. So it's... Uh, Everyone acknowledges the, the one that's, that's in the Gulf of Mexico. There are, some, there are some that say there was another meteor as well that hit somewhere like in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so there was like two meteors. Uh, Dr. Hanoka suggests, you know, what the Gemara, the Talmud and Brachas and, and Rosh Hashanah, says that when Hashem brought the flood to the world, it says that he took two stars from Kima, which is the constellation Aries, and that's how, he, it's like the tool that he utilized to, destroy, to, to, to bring about the flood. And so Dr. Hanoka suggests maybe that this is sort of the, uh, what, it, what instigated the flood, what, was, what the scientists, meaning what the scientists are discovering as that, that flood or major worldwide impact that, uh, you know, that uh, changed the world so drastically, uh, it could be a reference to that uh, in, in our own uh, Jewish literature. I'd, if we could save the questions to the end, just because the uh, just because of the uh, is that okay? Okay, don't forget it. Um, so, yeah, uh, as as far as as far as other uh, fields of science, I, I would suggest um, I, I could I could suggest to you further reading uh, 
the pillars of faith is is certainly one option that you could uh, take a look at. Uh, I want to I want to get out of the uh, the discussion from the you know sort of discussing from the from the from contemporary scientific research, and I would like to just discuss uh, conclude our discussion by by talking a little bit about um, from a Torah perspective how how we imagine the the, the Earth to be. Um, 5,776 years old plus six days. Um, what first thing that we have to know is that the Gemara says that the, the, the when Hashem created the world, He created everything in full form and, and stature. Meaning that when, when Hashem created trees, they weren't created as little saplings, they were created as fully large trees. Assu assu uh, one would assume that if you sort of chop that tree down, even though it was created five seconds ago, if you chop that large redwood tree down that Hashem created, you're going to find lots and lots of rings. Meaning, each ring uh, is, is one of the ways to determine how old a tree is. So even though the tree was really only created five seconds ago, the tree would, would appear to be maybe a hundred years old, or maybe a thousand, you know, much, much older than it actually was. The, the Talmud also says that Adam, Adam, the first man, was created as a as a twenty as a twenty year old man. That's Medrash it says in, in Bereshis Rabbah that Adam was created as a twenty year old. So meaning, even though he was only created five seconds ago, he had the body structure and the intellect of a twenty year old person. So meaning, there would be a discrepancy uh, in if you looked at him and it, and, it all, and to all external appearances in any test that would be made on Adam, he'd be a twenty year old the 20 year old man. Meanwhile, it was only created five seconds ago. So in a similar way, the earth was created with sort of a, a built-in history to it that, that, um, that gave it its appearance. Um, in the same way that, um, that everything was, was created in, in, a, in a way that would allow it to be fully functional for all the reasons that Hashem, uh, everything that Hashem wanted from it. Meaning, if Hashem wants several generations later that Avraham should be able to go outside of his tent and look up at the stars, that Hashem would have created the world in such a way that starlight would have been already already uh, flowing, and uh, not flowing, but starlight would have already been shining, and that when that in a way that Avraham would be able to see it when Hashem uh, tells him that your descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky. So everything again is created in a way that is, uh, is fully functioning. Uh, additionally, the universe changed in, in relation to Adam. Before the world was created, the malachim, the angels, protested and said, how are you going to create man? Man is going to sin. He's going to make this universe uh, a terrible place. And many places in our Jewish tradition were taught that everything that mankind does in particular, the Jewish community does, affects not only the person, but affects the entire universe. We are the center, we are the nucleus, we are the sole purpose of what this whole picture has been put here for. That being the case, when we do what's right, we uplift the entire universe, and when we do the opposite, we sort of downgrade it. And so when Adam, the key, the nucleus, the, the primary specimen that Hashem himself creates, forms him of the dust of the earth and, and inserts a soul into him, breathes a soul of life into him, when he messes up and he, he eats from the tree that he shouldn't be eating from, so it says that the nature of reality at the time changed. That before then, the universe functioned in a much sort of healthier way, faster way, whatever, and that when he sinned, things sort of slowed down. There was like a a change in the nature of reality. In the, the Divrei Chaim, Rabbi Chaim Halberstam of Sanz, says that in his time there was a, there was a question uh, presented. It says that in the, the, day, the days of the Arizal, there was a, a star that was discovered that takes 36,000 years, 36,000 years to orbit, to, to complete its orbit. Now, the, the question was, what's the need for 36,000? Why was the star even created if 
the Earth is only 6,000 years old and it's only going to exist for 7,000 years and Mashiach's going to come or whatever. What's the, what's the purpose of, this, uh, of that star? And so what was answered was that before Adam cre uh, sinned, the universe functioned in a, in a much faster way, a much more healthy way. And, and uh, as a result of his sin, that things slowed down and, and were sort of polluted um, and function in a completely different way, a slowed down way, a less healthy way. So what we're seeing today is sort of the results of this like, non-healthy universe um, from, from, uh, from, from, from Adam's uh, sin. Furthermore, um, it, it's brought down many places in... Uh, I, I'd, I'd really... If, if, you ha if you haven't been following until now, or if you haven't been listening until now, just tune in for the last, these last uh, five minutes of, of uh, these few words. Because this is probably the, the clearest way that we can understand the idea of how the world can appear much older than, uh, than it actually is according to the Torah. The idea is like this. Imagine you lived in a world where you had never seen a baby before. You never saw a baby. You knew that such a thing as a baby existed or that, that human beings came from this little creature called a baby, a newborn baby, but you've never seen a baby. You live in old people land. Okay? Everybody on your planet is the, has the body structure and the intellectual structure of a 75-year-old. So if you saw this quote-unquote 75-year-old person and wanted to backtrack how long it would take for this 75-year-old person to be in this state of a baby, in this newborn baby, you, what you would do is you would take what you know and you would incrementally measure backwards. So the difference body structure-wise, ability-wise, from a 70-year-old to a 75-year-old, is there much change? It's not really much change that, that takes place in the body. Even 65 to 70, an average healthy person, there's not that much change about the same size, have the same basic capabilities, not really that much change going on. However, in that, in that same five-year span, take a newborn baby and a five-year-old. A newborn baby is basically just like a blob, right? It can't do anything for itself. It's seven, eight pounds. It's what, 18, 19 inches, and it's completely helpless. So in five years' time, this little blob goes from being just a blob, a seven-pound blob. All of a sudden, it's five years old. It's tripled its size. It's quadrupled its weight. It can walk. It can talk. It can feed itself. It can talk back. It can do all sorts of things. It can think on its own. It can understand things. It can clean up. It can wreck. It can, it can make messes it becomes a fully functional, different entity. The difference between a, a newborn baby and a five-year-old is like night and day. Now, it's the same five-year span, but there's massive, catastrophic changes going on between a, a newborn baby and a five-year-old as opposed to a 70 to 75-year-old person. Now, if, you, if you're growing, again, if you're living in, in old people world, old people land, and you've never seen a baby before, and you were to backtrack and calculate, well, being that between 70 and 75, there's only a very small change that, that goes on. There's only a small change as far as maybe size or abilities or whatnot. So to get all the way back to this newborn baby, I, I would guess that this person would be like a thousand years old. Why? Because if you're only backtracking based on what you know in these small increments, in these small incremental changes, to get all the way back to the baby time, would take maybe like let's say a thousand years. You'd, you, because of the fact that you're unaware that in the beginning the baby is going is undergoing these massive quick changes that are completely uh, reshaping it. Uh, in, in the same way, you could say that you know if you're measuring it forward, you ever your parents ever? Uh, I know in my house we we did this, and a lot of a lot of people do this. Like when you know when you're six months old or you're a year old, so your parents will like mark on the wall in pencil like how tall you are, and then like, you know, you're two years old, how big your mark is in three and four, and if you, if you go by that rate of change, you know, by the time you're like, you know, 10 years old, you're gonna be 17 feet tall, because you, you keep like, when, in those early years, you're growing so fast and, and whatnot, you don't realize that, you know, things, things slow down. 
that it starts off really fast and, and, and all sorts of changes going on, and then as time goes by, the, the changes aren't as dramatic. It slows down, uh, it slows down a lot. Um, so uh, from a Torah perspective, when we, are, when we are looking back at the history of the universe, and the history of the world, if we're going by you know, the rate of change that, that goes on in the world now, and looking back, we would, we would think that the world, that the, that the universe, that the, uh, the earth is, uh, is billions of years old, and the universe is billions of years old, without knowing that in the beginning there were massive changes. According to our Torah, there were massive changes going, uh, going on that, that shaped our reality. Jewish tradition is filled with places that teach that the human being and the world are, are connected, they're, that, they are, that they're very much uh, interconnected with each other. A person is compar uh, compared to a small world. You know, you're a small world after all. You know? So the idea is that just as it exists in the person, that there's these rapid changes at the beginning, and then eventually things sort of like slow down and go at, function at a different rate, the same thing applies, applies in the universe. Um, with that, uh, I think we will uh, we'll conclude uh, for today. There's certainly many other things that could be discussed on this topic. Uh, I'd highly encourage anyone who is interested in the idea to, there's, there's great Torah books that are, that are written on this subject. Um, I can refer you uh, to them you know, afterwards or whatever. Um, but the, the main thing to remember is that as Jews, we have a very solid Torah tradition. And throughout history, there have been many, uh, many ideologies, many philosophies, um, or many worldviews that have come and gone and changed. There have been times in history where the Jewish people have tried to conform with the philosophy of the time, or with the science of the time, or the ideas of the time. And they've shortchanged themselves because in, in a, a certain period, those, those ideas were dropped and move on to the next thing. The consistent thing throughout history has been our Torah ideology. So uh, whatever way a person perceives the age of the earth, uh, it's a fascinating topic and one that uh, through it I hope that we should all grow in our Jewish learning, our Jewish observance, and increase in our service of Hashem. Thank you.